All right, you know, I always uh, I like to review. Sometimes it may get tedious, but I try to keep it from doing, being that way. But uh, I'll get to where we left off, but let me remind you, we're in this, in this section, in the main section of Hebrews, 4.14 through 10.25, is an exposition on the high priesthood of Christ. And early in that exposition, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, he introduces this idea of Jesus as a Melchizedekian kind of priest. And he's going to get to that, and he has a lot to say about that. But having mentioned it in chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, he then has one of these uh, interjection of exhortation, where he kind of pauses and exhorts and urges his hearers. And I say hearers because although this is written, this is really essentially a written sermon. And he pauses there to urge them and warn them about some things. And he does that in chapter 5, verse 11, through chapter 6, verse 20. Then in chapter 7, 1, he picks back up with the Christ-Melchizedek parallel. And then that can, he continues with the theme of Christ's high priesthood down through chapter 10, verse 25. So at the beginning of this, this particular interjection of exhortation, beginning in chapter 5, 11 through 14. In that, in that section, he tells his hearers that rather than being content with and only interested in the ABCs of the Christian faith, the basics of the Christian faith, they need to move beyond those things and allow God to, to move them to a fuller, deeper grasp of the faith. And then in chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he lists three pairs of teachings that he includes among the basic things. Six items that, in Coaster's words, span the journey of faith from initial repentance to final judgment. It's his hope, he says at 6.3, he makes clear it's his hope and his intention that the readers or the hearers, that they will indeed go beyond the basic things, that they'll move toward completeness, that they will awaken, they will repent of, shake off this, infant mindset into which they have regressed so that they can absorb the meteor things that he's going to be sharing with them. And it's important for Christians to move beyond the basics because as he indicates in chapter 6 verses 4 through 8, failing to do so increases not only the danger that they'll fall away from God, that they'll fall into sin, be alienated from God, which is terrible in its own right, but it increases the danger that they may even fall beyond the ability to return. So there is a falling that you can fall to where you get to where your repenting apparatus is disabled and you're not coming back. Now, as we talked about where that line is, you and I don't know. You and I call everybody. But there is a point, and he uses a worst-case scenario to warn them about the danger of failing to grow and to failing to mature and go on to maturity. But he then says, and that's in 6, 4 through 8, but he, he then says in verses 9 through 12 of chapter 6, that despite the grave state into which failing to move to maturity can lead, this state of this worst case scenario of falling beyond the ability to return, he has something better in mind. He's confident that they will receive the blessings of salvation, for they have been and continue to be living in faith. And he says, just because you're being tempted, God's not going to forget the fact that you're faithful people and have been serving. So he encourages them in, in verses 9 through 12. His concern is that they be diligent to the end. The race must be run to the end. And we talked about that. You know, you, you have to be faithful till the end. And that's what he wants, he wants of them. Then in, in verses 13 through 20 of chapter 6, he reinforces this appeal to steadfast. He says, look, you have to stick with it. You have to be faithful to the end. And remember, he's writing people who are what? They're being tempted to turn away from allegiance to Christ to go and identify with some form of Judaism for a host of possible reasons why they're doing that. But he says, no, you, know, you have to remain faithful. And so he reinforces his appeal to steadfastness by explaining in verses 13 through 20 of chapter 6 that God's promise to Abraham, of which they are heirs, will without doubt be received through patient faithfulness just as it was in the case of Abraham. You know, be patient, faithfulness, stick to it, remain faithful, be steadfast, and you will receive the promise of blessing that was given to Abraham just as he did. And so this is what he's telling them in 13 through 20. He says, indeed, God guaranteed his promise to Abraham with an oath that was sworn by his own name because he wanted to make it crystal clear to the heirs of that promise, that's us, 
Okay? Children of Abraham by faith, descendants of Abraham by faith. He wanted to make it crystal clear to them that his intention would not change. And you can't get any clearer than what he's done. The salvation God has planned for the descendants of Abraham is written in stone, so to speak. He not only has promised it, which is good enough, right? I mean, if God says something, that's good enough. But he went the extra mile and he had an oath with it. He swore it with his own name. So, you know, you, what else can God say? His intention is immutable that he will bless the descendants of Abraham. So he says, be steadfast in your faith. Don't be suckered into turning away from it. Because it's absolutely guaranteed that God will give the blessings of Abraham to his descendants. Those who, are, who stay steadfast in faith, they will receive it absolutely. There is no question about that. And in, in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 6, he brings the sermon back to the discussion of chapter 5, verses 10 through 11. Back to where he was when he began this interjection of exhortation. Back to this notion of... Uh, Melchizedek and his relationship with Jesus. Remember he says that he had more to say about that? He gets to that in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. It's an exposition. Those verses are an exposition on this enigmatic figure, this enigmatic character, Melchizedek. And We talked about this last week. Melchizedek serves as a type of Christ, okay, as a type of eternal, non-Levitical priest, what he foreshadows as a type, Jesus fulfills as the reality. So we talked about, you know, type or some people who think, is he some kind of heavenly figure and went through that? And I favor the type idea, okay, that he is just, he is a type of eternal non-Levitical priest. Jesus fulfills that shadow in reality. Then in verses uh, 4 through 10 of chapter 7, he makes the point that Melchizedek's priesthood, Melchizedek is a type of Christ, Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood because the Levitical priesthood traces its ancestry to Abraham and, and Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. So his priesthood is greater than a priesthood that traces its descent to Abraham. And so he's saying, listen, Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than that of Abraham. You say, well, how does he get to that idea? I understand he says it's, he's greater than the Levitical priest because the Levitical priests trace their ancestry to Abraham and he's greater than Abraham, well, the case he makes that he's greater than Abraham is because Abraham paid a tenth of the spoils to, Mel to Melchizedek, after which time Melchizedek blessed him. So he says, Melchizedek, clearly he's, he is superior to Abraham, so his priesthood is superior to the priesthood that descends from Abraham. That's, that's the point that he's making. He also notes it. Uh, notes Melchizedek's superiority to the Levitical priest because unlike them, he's presented in Scripture as one who does not die. Okay, that's how he's part of a type of e an eternal non-Levitical priesthood. Okay, we went through all that, but I always like to pick you back up. Now in chapter 7, verses 11 through 28, he discusses the superiority of Jesus, our eternal Melchizedekian high priest. He's a priest on the order of, like Melchizedek. Melchizedek's the type. Jesus is the fulfillment. And in 11 through 28, he's going to discuss the superiority of Jesus. And that's where I want to pick back up. I think I read some of this. But i got a couple of slides here, so I'll go one, two, and then go back to this one. He says, now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for concerning it the people have been given law, what further need for another priest to arise? one named according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity a change, a change of the law also occurs. For the one about whom these things are said belong to another tribe from which no one has served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord descended from Judah, about which tribe Moses said nothing concerning priests. And it is much more obvious still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not according to a law of physical order, a law of descent, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is testified about him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For, the, for on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law perfected nothing. On the other hand, there is the introduction of a better hope 
through which we draw near to God. Okay, if I, did that change? Let me go back to, all right, back to, back to that one. Now he says here, look, if perfection in the sense of completion or fulfillment of God's eternal purpose could be attained through the Levitical priesthood, if that were something that could occur, which priesthood was bound to the law that defined and regulated it? These things are part of a package. If perfection in the sense of God, of completion or fulfillment of God's eternal purpose could be accomplished through that Levitical priesthood, well then there would be no need for a new order of priesthood. If that priesthood was sufficient to do the job, there would be no need for a new order of priesthood. Put it differently, it's because God's ultimate goal could not be established through the Levitical priesthood that there was the need for a different kind of priest, the one promised in Psalms 110.4, one in the order of Melchizedek rather than in the order of Aaron. You see, so here it's been prepared. He says, look, we have this Levitical priesthood that's tied up to the law, but that's not going to achieve God's ultimate eternal purpose. There is a need for a new order of priesthood, one on the order of Melchizedek, not a descendant of Aaron. So he says, look, if the Levitical priesthood was sufficient for God's eternal purpose, if perfection in that sense could be achieved through the Levitical priesthood, it wouldn't have been necessary to announce the coming of a priest from a different kind of order. And this is Jesus. He's announced the coming of Jesus in Psalm 110.4 as a priest on the order of Melchizedek. And when the priesthood is changed, as it was with Jesus, right? Because we have Levitical priests, priests who are descendants of Aaron, who's a subset of Levi, right? So we have, we have the Levitical priest that's changed. And now we have with Jesus, we have a, a, someone who's a non-Levitical priest, so there has been a change in the priesthood. Well, when that happens, the law also changes. Okay, the law also changes because the law's requirements governing the old priesthood necessarily are superseded in the appointment of a new priest who doesn't meet those requirements, right? If I have a law that says, here are the requirements for a priest, here comes the appointment of a priest who's outside of those requirements, well, then that law has been superseded because this priest who has been appointed, doesn't meet those requirements. It has been put out. It has been uh, pushed aside, made obsolete. And that's what he's telling us. And remember the, the context he's telling them in, because he wants them to see the superiority of Jesus Christ. You know, like Peter said, to whom shall we go? Whenever anybody is tempted, whether it's to go back to some form of Judaism or whether it's to go back to the world, to go back to their old life, to go back to anything, look what you're leaving. There's no one like him. There is no one like him. You can't go somewhere and get a substitute for Jesus. Okay, so this is, he wants them to see the superiority and he's casting it and explaining it in terms of you are turning from the greater and you're in danger of going to the lesser that has no effect. And so he, he's explaining this to them. Now the law was changed in the case of Christ's appointment to the priesthood because he descended from the tribe of Judah and the priestly requirements that were given by Moses, they made no allowance for descendants of Judah to serve as priest. He's from Judah, right? I mean, he's a descendant of David. And so the law didn't make allowance for descendants of Judah to serve as priests, yet here he is serving as priest. So the law has been put aside. Something new, a new covenant has been introduced. If I can get this guy to click over to that next slide. Okay, so the change in the law here. There's a change in the law that's associated with Christ's priesthood. He says it's all the more evident. You have this fact, you have the change in the law given by the fact Christ is a descendant of Judah, the Mosaic law makes no allowance for descendants of Judah to serve as priests. He is serving as a priest, so therefore something has happened to this law. But then he says that the change in the law uh, that's associated with Christ's priesthood is all the more evident by the fact uh, Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. In the sense he's immortal, okay, as is or as was Melchizedek typologically. I went through all that, you know, things about type last week. But he is a type. Typologically, he is eternal. Christ is a high priest on the order of Melchizedek in the sense he is, in fact, immortal. He is the fulfillment of that type. 
And so he says, look, you have a change in the law with Christ's priesthood. It's all the more evident by the fact that Jesus is like Melchizedek in the, in the sense that he is immortal, a circumstance for which the regulations of the Levitical priest, they made no provision for that. There's nothing in the law of Moses about an eternal Levitical priest. They have this idea of descent and who's going to come after somebody dies. So here you have something's up and he's saying, listen, there has been this shift, this change in the law. So the introduction of the new priesthood in Christ, it results in the one hand on the setting aside of the Mosaic law, which was weak and useless. Okay, it was weak and useless in what sense? In the sense that it didn't perfect anything. It didn't complete or fulfill God's eternal purpose. It wasn't designed for that role. Okay, it was provisional. It was something that was temporary. But on the one hand, you see, we have the, the setting aside of that which was weak and useless. And on the other hand, you have the introduction of a new priesthood. The introduction of a new priesthood in Christ, it brings what? A better hope. Okay, a better hope. A hope through which what? We draw near to God. So he's saying, listen, things are better. Christ is superior. Why would you ever want to abandon him? He has introduced something, a better hope. And you are in danger of turning to... Now, if, if they can say that to those folks, what can we say to people who are tempted to leave Jesus to return to a sinful life? Well, you say, what? You know, come on. Look, look who you're in danger of abandoning. He is the hope of humanity. There is one hope. Jesus Christ, and you are in danger of turning from this great, glorious, effective high priest who brings something that is superior, better than anything this world has ever seen. And what are you going to do? You're not even going to be like these people to go wallow in a shadow. You're going to go wallow in a pig pen. And you ha we have to paint Christ and get people to see Jesus. And this is what he's doing in the context in which he's writing. Then he says in the next verses, verse 20 to 22, he says, And insofar as it was not without an oath... For those who became priests are without an oath, but this one became a priest through the one saying to him, the Lord swore and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So he says, and so it was not, and, and insofar as it was not without an oath, then down to verse 22, so far Jesus also has become a guarantee of a better covenant. See, unlike the Levitical priests, those who descend according to the law of Moses, unlike those priests, Jesus called to the priesthood it includes this irrevocable oath that he will be a priest forever. This is out of Psalm 110. Okay, we have God swearing he's going to be a priest forever. These other priests didn't have this oath. They weren't like that. And this means that he has become a guarantee of a better covenant. He will be a priest forever, sworn by God, so he's a guarantee of a better covenant. Here's how Guthrie puts it. He says, in the present context, the author pictures Jesus as the one who guarantees God's covenant promises. The hearers, as new covenant people, have a covenant that is better because by virtue of God's oath, Jesus, the mediator of that covenant, see, for example, 8-6, uh, uh, holds an unalterable position. Our hope, therefore, rests on the most secure of terms. Jesus is our high priest. He is our high priest by oath. His position is permanent, unalterable. He is immortal. Okay? There is no one like him. And so there is no place to go. I mean, I just love Peter's words when he says, you know, when Jesus turns to him and says, are you going to leave also? To whom should we go? Where are you going to go? Wherever you go other than Christ, you're going to some kind of made-up junk. Some kind of thing that is fabricated to fool you into believing it can serve as a substitute for Jesus Christ and there is no substitute for Jesus Christ. People have to see it, know it, so they recognize eyes wide open, it's Jesus. Now, you're going to turn from him and walk over here, understand who you're leaving. Okay? Understand that. Then he says in verse 23 through 25, he says, and on the one hand... The priests have become many because they were prevented by death from remaining in office. But on the other hand, because he continues forever, he has a permanent priesthood. 
And so he is able also to save absolutely those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Okay? Now, whereas mortality, death, kept the Levitical priests from remaining in office, which is why there have been so many of them since Aaron. That's what he says. They all die, right? Because we live in a fallen world and death is part of this reality. And so he says, they're mortal, their mortality keeps them uh, from remaining in office. That's why there have been so many of them. But Jesus has a permanent priesthood because he is immortal. Jesus is immortal. As Paul says in Romans 6, verse 9, death no longer has mastery over him. Why? Well, he's raised from the dead. He has risen. He has defeated death. Death no longer has mastery over him. He has defeated death. He has raised and we share in that victory. Okay? We share in that victory which will be consummated, fully realized. It's like the thing where people say, well, you know, it's this idea of New Testament theology, the now and the not yet. He is the first fruit. We share in that at his return fully. It's like D-Day and Victory Day. Right? You've heard that analogy where on D-Day... It was over. The enemy's back was broken. It was a fait accompli. But when did it actually fully be realized? Okay, it shook out a while. That's how this is. Jesus here, he is, he is no longer subject to death. He is immortal. And so unlike these Levitical priests, Jesus is immortal. And because his priesthood is permanent, he's able, he says, to fully or to, to save fully or for all time those who come to God through him, since he's always there to make intercession for them. There's one sacrifice, but there's ongoing intercession. Jesus is making intercession for us, and aren't you grateful? See, it reminds me of what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, 31 through 34, where he says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You see, and so this is the picture, and he will develop this picture of Christ seated at the right hand of God, interceding for his people. Now, how would you like, you know, how would you like to have, you know, you're thinking about what intercessor would you like to have? Well, I want this one. I want this one who is God the Son, who has died and given his life in sacrifice so that God forgives through him justly and righteously over here saying, she's mine. She's mine. You know, I remember this. I saw this guy on television years ago. He was talking about he was over in the Middle East. I think it was, uh, I can't think, is it E.V. Hill? He's a Baptist preacher. And he was on there and he was saying something. He was in the Middle East and he was over here with this entourage. And, you know, everybody knew the leader of the entourage, but they didn't know this guy. And he was just kind of a hanger on and he's back there going in and and they were going to leave him out. The security people were icing him out. And then the guy who was the head of the thing turned back and said, he's with me. And, oh, okay, well, then he came in. Well, that's how it is, you see. She's mine. And so, I, you know, the, this idea of Christ interceding for us. And this is one of the things, like with the Catholics, when they got off on the, the idea of exalting Mary, and I think Mary's to be honored. Mary gave birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. But the idea of making her some kind of intercessor because Jesus is too big and all this stuff, too he's too exalted, I need somebody who can relate to me more, well, that to me misses entirely the point of Hebrews. He relates to you completely. And he is there interceding. And there is no intercessor like him. You know, none who can can compare with him. And he says in 26 through 28, He says, for such a high priest was indeed fitting for us, one who is holy, innocent, undefiled, having been separated from the sinners, meaning he didn't sin, and having become higher than the heavens, 
who does not have a necessity as the other high priests to offer up daily a sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this one did this once when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath that came after the law appoints the son who has been made perfect forever. Now see, these verses, they really, they sum up the discussion of the son's appointment as a superior high priest that began in chapter 5, verse 1, that discussion that was interrupted, so to speak, by the, the interjection of exhortation in verses 5, 11 through 6, 20. It sums up the son's, the son's appointment as a high priest. Jesus is the kind of high priest we need. Okay, he's the kind of high priest we need, one with a character and status greater than that of earthly priests. See, unlike the earthly priest, he's sinless. Sinless. Okay, he's sinless and he has no need to offer sacrifices for his own sin. Rather, he offers himself as a sacrifice for the sins of others. Well, this is the kind of priest that we need. This one. Then a reference in 27, in the second part of 27, is uh, if you're you know, tuned into the Old Testament, you may have a question about this, but there's a reference to daily sacrifices of high priests. It says, first for their own sin and then for the sins of the people. Well, that raises this question because the double sacrifice of the high priest for his own sins and then for the sins of others, that was specified on the annual day of atonement. So it was an annual thing. Why does he refer to it as a daily thing? Okay, so this is a question. I think the answer, it seems to lie in the fact that on many occasions during the year, the high priest, he involved himself with the other priests as they officiated, especially during the week before the Day of Atonement. And you see references to this idea in Josephus and in Philo. So he's, he's apparently picking up what happened in fact is that you had priests who would join in the officiating the high priest with the other priest, and in, in that capacity they would wind up offering sacrifices for their own sins and then for the sins of others. So it did have a daily aspect to it. Let me read you this quote from Neil Lightfoot. Neil is, uh, I don't know if he's still teaching at Abilene Christian, but he's done a lot of work on, uh, on Hebrews. This is from his commentary on Hebrews. He says, Josephus relates that on many occasions during the year, the high priest involved himself with the other priests as they officiated on the days of weekly Sabbath, of new moon, of national festivals, and annual gatherings of all the people. The law instructed the priest that if he committed sins unwittingly in any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, he was to offer a young unblemished bull to the Lord for a sin offering. Remembering other super precautions of the Jews to avoid sin, it's probably correct to say that the later high priest did make daily offerings, just as the author says. Philo is in agreement, describing the high priest as one who day by day offers prayers and sacrifices for the people. So they involved themselves, it seems, in, with the other priest, the high priest, and once they did that, you can be sure that they would be offering sacrifices to make sure that they were clean. So this is probably where this idea, anyway... That maybe that's a little rabbit trail that's, uh, I just wonder if that stuck you and you say, well, what about that? And there you have my two cents on that. Okay. All right. Back here in the, unlike the earthly priest. Okay. This is, the, here in these verses, he's summing up the, this discussion of the son's appointment as the superior high priest. Okay. So we see this, uh, this idea. This is the kind of priest we need. Unlike the earthly priest whose ministry is confined to the earthly tabernacle, you see here where he says, having become higher than the heavens. Okay, well, he's not confined to the earthly tabernacle. He ministers in heaven itself, where he sits at the right hand of God. And this point is going to be emphasized in the next couple of verses, okay, after 28. But he's not in this shadow. He's not ministering in this earthly thing that is part of this temporal reality that is going to get the ultimate makeover. No, he's in the permanent eternal realm where he's actually ministering in the presence of God in that special sense. And then the old priest, as uh, Guthrie says, the old priests were appointed by virtue of the law, but were weak. Well, weak in what sense? They were weak that they were sinful. They were weak that they were mortal. Okay, so the old priest appointed by the law were weak, but the son was appointed by God's oath, and he's been made perfect forever. 
Okay, now on this idea of made perfect forever, let me read to you what Donald Hagner says. I like this. <clears throat> he says, Thus the Son, having accomplished his once and for all sacrifice, has brought God's saving purposes as well as his own personal calling to their goal, all of which produces a state of completion and permanence. This is in contrast to the law that could bring nothing to this stage of completeness and fulfillment. That's what I'm talking about when I said, when he says it's not perfect, it could make nothing perfect. It could not bring to completion God's eternal purpose. Only Jesus does that. Only Jesus, he comes here, he, he comes and dies and ushers in God's eternal purpose that will be consummated when he returns. Okay, so you have this idea of inauguration, consummation, but I think that's what he's, <clears throat> what he's driving at. Then in chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, he says, Now the main point of the things being said is this. You've got to like it when the writer says that. You know, you're sitting here scratching around, but he says, Now listen, the main point of what's being said is this. We have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, which the Lord, not man, put up. We've got this kind of priest. I've been portraying for you all about Jesus, this great priest, better covenant, better this, everything. Sinless. Who fulfills God's purpose. He brings about the fulfillment. He's the perfect one. We've got that high priest. So can you see he's sitting there like going, why in the world would you ever turn from him? We have that perfect high priest in Jesus Christ. He ministers in heaven itself. See, the main point of what he's saying is that Christians have the kind of high priest he's described. One who's sinless, eternal, sympathetic, and was appointed by an oath. We have that kind of high priest. And this high priest, Jesus Christ, he ministers not in the earthly sanctuary, but in heaven itself where he sits at the right hand of God. Now, you want a priest? Talking to these hearers. You want to go back to some priest? We got the priest. Christians, we have the priest. See, he ministers in the true sanctuary. True in what sense? True in the sense to quote Bruce... It's in the sense it is the only one which is not an imitation of something better. He's in the reality of which these earthly sanctuaries are a shadow. The reality that's reflected in the earthly tabernacle he's writing about where you have these, this ministry being carried on. He has gone into heaven itself. He sits at God's right hand in heaven itself. And he also he makes a superior offering. He says in verse eight, chapter 8 verse 3, he says, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something which he might offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who minister in a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned when he intended to complete the tabernacle, for he says, see that you will make it according to all the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a superior ministry inasmuch as he also is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted upon better promises. Okay, since every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, Jesus, being a high priest... Well, he must have something to offer. And he does have something to offer. His offering was specified in chapter 7, verse 27. He offered himself. He offered himself once as a sacrifice for sin. So high priests have gifts and offerings. He's a high priest. What's his offering? His offering is himself. Crucified. For the sins of people. See, his offering, it was specified there. Coaster remarks in his commentary, he says, the fact Jesus sat down, chapter 8, verse 1, shows that the need for sacrifice has ended, chapter 10, 11 through 18, although Christ's intercession on behalf of others continues. One sacrifice for all time. The completely, perfectly fulfilling, atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Yet he continues to intercede. See, if Jesus were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, and the reason is that the high priestly ministry of the new covenant, it's conducted in heaven itself. 
Well, where's the ministry of the new covenant, the priestly ministry of the new covenant? Jesus conducts it where? He conducts it in heaven itself, not in an earthly tabernacle that's a copy or a shadow of the heavenly reality. See, those who are ministering there, they're simply ministering in this copy or shadow of the heavenly, heavenly reality. His priestly ministry, the priestly ministry of the new covenant, is conducted in heaven itself. And this is important, it's significant. So if Jesus were on earth, the new covenant wouldn't be in effect. If he were here ministering, because the, the priestly ministry of the new covenant is in heaven itself, it's the reality, not the shadow. So if he were on earth, well then the new covenant wouldn't be in effect, and he of course wouldn't be serving as a priest, because the old covenant, the law says, nobody from Judah is serving as a priest. Okay? But... You see, he has been indispensable here, it says in verse 6. But now he has obtained a superior ministry inasmuch as he also is the mediator of a better covenant. He mediates under the new covenant where the priestly ministry of the new covenant is in heaven itself because he is the mediator of the new covenant. He has ushered in the new covenant. He has brought it. The other was obsolete in passing and he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary rather than in a copy. Okay, so those, you have the fact that you have ministry in the tabernacle, in these earthly shadows and copies in the passing realm, that points to what? Christ heavenly, the truth, the reality. Ministry in those sanctuaries, it points to the reality of Christ's heavenly ministry. He's obtained this ministry that's superior to that conducted by the Levitical priest, and he's done that, see, in conjunction with the fact he's the mediator of a better covenant that's enacted on better promises. Everything's coming up what? Better, superior, greater, grander. And he's writing to people who are what? They're thinking about going saying, you know, this is looking good to me over here. And he's just sitting there going, no. No, this is where you need to look. Let me introduce this and then the bell will ring. I heard that first bell. Okay. He says, for if that first covenant was faultless, a place for a second would not have been sought. For finding fault with them, he says, now he's going to quote Jeremiah, and I try to indicate that by the, the indentation here. He says, look, days are coming, says the Lord, and I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took their hand to lead them from the land of Egypt, okay, not like the Mosaic covenant, okay, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I had no concern for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them upon their hearts. And I will be God to them, and they will be a people to me, and they shall not teach. Each one his fellow citizen, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will not remember their sins any longer. When he says new, he has made the first obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and is becoming old is on the verge of disappearance. Okay, he's contrasting now, he's going to speak here of the superiority of this new covenant that Jesus has brought in, of which Jesus is the mediator and under which he serves as high priest in the heavenly reality. He's going to talk about the superiority of this new covenant, and I'll speak till the bell rings. <laughs> okay, the superiority of the new covenant is evident from the fact that there, there would have been no need for God to announce in Jeremiah's day the coming of a new covenant if the first covenant, the Mosaic covenant, had been sufficient for achieving God's ultimate purpose. Why would he have said there's a new one coming? If the first one was sufficient, if it was going to achieve God's ultimate eternal purpose, there would be no need for him to introduce a new one. The very fact he introduces a new one is a signal that this one is temporary. This one is provisional. It is unable to do, to accomplish God's ultimate purpose. And as verse 13 makes clear, the key for the author in this Jeremiah text is the use of the word new to describe the covenant that he's going to establish. That's what's pivotal here. When he, when he describes that as new, see, by calling the covenant new, the one that Jeremiah announces, 
by calling that covenant new, that he indicated that the Mosaic covenant, see, with its mandated priesthood and sacrifices, it was destined for obsolescence. Once he introduced this idea of new, once he, through the Spirit of God, says, I'm bringing a new covenant. Okay, well, what's the, what happens to this one? This baby's wrinkling already. See, once he calls that one new, you know that this one is designed for obsolescence. It was something that was transitory and would, by the design of God, what? Be replaced. So it was something, it was it, right from the get-go. When he called it, he says, I'm going to bring in a covenant that's going to be new. Well, what's this one then? This one's old. This one's passing. See, what, what's in that category, what's been destined by God for obsolescence is expiring and thus is on the brink of disappearing, however long it may, it may you know, balance there. As soon as he announces this one's old, this baby's history. Now, how long is it going to teeter there? That's up for God to say. And we know how long it teetered there. It teetered there until Jesus comes. Okay, let me read you a couple guys here and then I think I'll shut up. Okay, Attridge on this idea says, In Hebrews' eyes, the old covenant was near its end as soon as the oracle of a new was spoken. F.F. Bruce, he says, that by predicting the inauguration of the new covenant, Jeremiah, in effect, announced the impending dissolution of the old order. Victor Fitzner, last guy, he says, The Sinai covenant was antiquated, growing old, from the moment that promise of Jeremiah 31 was uttered. So when he says it, Okay, this one's obsolete, destined for obsolescence, teetering there, growing old. And so once that announcement, so the fact he announces a new one shows this one's destined for obsolescence. And that is what has taken place in Jesus Christ. We serve under a new covenant that is better all around. He'll go on and elaborate that, and I'll talk about that next week. Thank you for coming.